Does it taste me a minute to get it up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Christine, do you mind putting the presentation back up? I am. Thank you, ma'am. I mean, I know you're probably fixing five computers and answer an email and paying a bill or two, but I want to know who the one was. Who the one was? They said no, not here. Yeah. No, it wasn't. It was he hasn't logged in yet. Chief, do you want to say something? Because we are live now. Uh, I'll probably wait till we get a little closer to six. Okay. Let me see. Will it allow us to share it right now, or is it? Yeah, you can share it to the page. Okay. Yeah, 
Let's go ahead and have uh, the two that are talking on the slides come up and sit with us. Page desk. <clears throat> Vice bones, fix the blow up. Hey, y'all can come up here for your slides. Please come up here. Do you want to just present from up here? Do I have to push the one to actually get it to project out? It doesn't project out, it just records, and that way they hear on Facebook. So, like right now, you don't have to push it for them to hear you? No, they're right now. So, everybody in Facebook land, say hi to firefighter Luke Wisneski. Hey, I'm, I'm just being serious. I'm just asking because technology is wild nowadays. Yeah. And we got Johnny Montiel. Okay. No reason to be here. Uh, there was. Welcome to the as we prepare to get started, uh, there's a QR code on the screen that you can use on your phone. That way you can answer questions and ask questions and provide data if you would like to. Uh, those that are present, of course, can ask questions as the slides pop up. But we wanted to provide an interactive platform, not only for everybody here, but also those that are potentially watching on Facebook that weren't able to be here. Uh, the information we get will be helpful not only for us, but also all the governing bodies associated with all of our departments. So if you don't mind answering a few questions, that'd be great. It's completely anonymous. It does filter profanity. And I'm only looking at one person when I say that. <laughs> so we'll get started in just a few minutes. <clears throat> Bunch of hugs, though. <laughs>
All right, if y'all don't mind, we're going to go ahead and get started. I don't believe in punishing the punctual as my e-dispatch goes off. Um, I hope everybody's been able to log into the AHA slide slash FPW for Fire Prevention Week 2023 or scan the QR code. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some input from you guys and input from everybody online. I'd like to welcome everybody and introduce all of our PFD personnel. Over here on the by far left, we have Firefighter Colton Wilson. Second Lieutenant Gavin Schultz, Battalion Chief Randy Soto, Battalion Chief Hugh Frank, Lieutenant Artie James, and Firefighter Luke Wisneski. In the back, we have our clerk slash EMT, Emma Mitchell, Firefighter Hector Garcia, Firefighter Salvador Lazoya, Firefighter Jonathan Ortega, and then our most recent hire, standing in the back, acting all nervous and scared, <laughs> is firefighter Francisco Chavez. Uh, so thank you all for coming. We appreciate your support and we will continue on. Okay, this is an interactive presentation. So if you'll move on to the next slide. Okay, are you here in person or line? I, I, I just wanted to see if we were gonna get anybody online to answer. So we'll see if we have any online person. So we'll give it a few minutes. Anybody have any trouble logging in? Everybody got it that wants to? Somebody's blowing up the heart button, Ortega. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. This is probably, oh, my apologies. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. Okay, so it'll give you an option on your device to name three firefighters or EMTs that you know, and it's going to present up in a word cloud on our screen. So go ahead and you can type last names, first names, whatever you'd like to type, and we'll see who you know. And then as there's more votes for that person, it gets bigger. So apparently M is the most popular. I would say, so we get to see who the favorite is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and it tells us participants are typing. While we have a minute, I would like to thank my two sons, Aiden and Jace, for their help earlier, getting everything set up. And all the B-shifters that helped us get set up, I appreciate you guys. We'll let participants type for just a little bit longer. Apparently, Jonathan's typing his own name 15 times. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> All right, since Emma won, we'll just go on to the next slide. <laughs> At Portales Fire Department, as always, our mission is to be prepared and ready to serve to provide the highest quality service to our community. And to quote the old show, Emergency, we're a rolling arsenal against death and destruction. Moving on to the next slide, this is this year's Fire Prevention Week theme is Cooking Safety Starts With You, Pay Attention to Fire Prevention. And that's why we're here tonight is talk about fire prevention and a few other data information and stuff so that we can ask questions, we can get the results that we need. Moving on to the next slide, why is pre fire prevention important to you? So let's see, why is fire prevention important to you? Safety? It's important for you to be safe at your home. It's important for all the first responders to be safe. Lives, <laughs> prevent fire, safety, safety. I don't want my house to burn down. Amen to that. <laughs> Job security. Safety, keeping my family, home, and neighborhood <laughs> safe, I'm guessing. Makes my job easier. <laughs> Keep from burning alive, really? Reduce number of fires. I mean, that's the whole point of fire prevention, is to keep people safe. Okay, so we got some newcomers. So this is interactive. So there's a QR code on your screen. If you hold your phone up to it, you can open it and answer questions and so on. It should bring you to this slide. If you have any issues, holler at me. The number of fires make job easier safety a whole lot of safety right 
All right, let's go on to the next one. All right, so on this one, we have Second Lieutenant Gavin Schultz. It's going to talk about kit safety in the kitchen. <clears throat> a few things to think about whenever you're in the kitchen at home. Uh, the kitchen is the number one area where you have home fires that start. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to what you're cooking. Um, as silly as it is, some of your cooking wear isn't necessarily fire resistant. So you're going to want to make sure that you never leave your cooking unattended, even for a short amount of time. You have all of your plastic cookware and things like that, that whenever you leave it on the stove, it has the potential to melt or catch on fire. Uh, you want to keep anything that can catch fire, like oven mitts away from a cooking area. Uh, a lot of your cooking mitts or, or your hot pan uh, pads and stuff like that are flammable. So you want to keep those away from anywhere that's going to get them too hot. You want to avoid wearing loose fitting clothing that can catch fire while you're cooking. So if you have like really baggy sleeves on your sweatshirt or um, you, know, you don't want to like wear a blanket or something into the kitchen <laughs> and because you have the potential of catching it on fire. And you want to establish a kid-free zone of at least three feet around your stove to prevent burns and other injuries. Uh, one of the other things that you want to try and do is make sure that all your pot handles and things like that are turned towards the back or the middle of the stove. And it just uh, makes it harder for even if you do have a, a kid or somebody that comes into the kitchen and you're not paying attention to the stove, it makes it harder for them to accidentally burn themselves or catch something on fire. Thank you, sir. So moving on to the next slide, in a home, where is the most common area for a fire? And there is one right answer. And y'all are smart. Oh. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, for this one, we have firefighter Luke Wisniewski from B Shift that's going to be talking about smoke detectors and the sounds of fire safety. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and start this off with everybody needs to be testing their fire alarms in their home. Um, fire alarms are a big importance in safety in general. Um, fire alarms do need to be tested out monthly. Um, they could be tested up to multiple times a month, but it is recommended on at least once a month. Um, so all of our fire alarms, things like that, they do require batteries. Um, it is wise to change them out at least once a year. And a um, lot, lot of the recommendations is 10 years to replace your smoke alarms. Um, it would be beneficial if you do change it prior to that but it is recommended at 10 years. Um, like I said at the beginning, fire alarms are a big part of safety. You know, having working fire alarms, or excuse me, smoke alarms, they do save lives. They have done wonderful over the years. They're getting, there's more advantages to them than people might think. Um, so just with an overall smoke alarm, with a continuous three, three beeps usually indicates that you do have smoke and or a potential fire inside your home. Uh, best thing to do is just get out, stay out, call 911 and we'll get it going that way. Uh, we also do have things like carbon monoxide alarms. Uh, the, all they do is they go ahead and they test for carbon monoxide inside your house. Uh, they do beep about four times in a row and then it will pause back into another four beeps. And again, it's another one of those get out, stay out, call 911. Um, fire alarms do have a chirp every once in a while. When your batteries get low enough, they will chirp. They will uh, notify you that it is time to change a battery. Um, so yeah, just go ahead and make sure you're testing your fire alarm, your smoke alarms monthly, your carbon monoxide. And just thank you, Luke. So the next question is, do you have working smoke detectors in your home? Oh, 
Overwhelming majority say yes. That's good. Very good. Okay. Now the next question is, when was the last time you checked the batteries on your home smoke detectors? All the firefighters are cringing. <laughs> good. That was good. Replace them. Yes, it is. Okay, moving on to the next slide, we have firefighter Colton Wilson going to talk about home escape plans. All right, good evening. Uh, so we really don't ever want to use this, but it's always great to practice it that way when in an emergency, you already know what to do and you're not trying to fumble around trying to figure out what the next step is. So practicing is the most uh, best thing you can do. So first thing we're gonna do is going to get a map drawn up of your house, uh, where all your doors are located, every room, all the windows, all your possible exits, anything that might be blocked that you can't leave out of, and all stairwells and uh, things such like that. Your second is going to be uh, to identify each door and window in each room and uh, make sure they're also not blocked, as it says in theory, not blocked, or any furniture or anything in front of it that's going to cause you to miss or uh, prevent you from getting out of those exits. And then we're going to find a safe place outside the home far enough away so that you're not in danger of any of the smoke or anything coming out. That way you can meet your family and stuff there and get uh, 911 on the way called so we can get over there. Uh, your fifth one is also always, like Luke said earlier, check your smoke, detar smoke detectors every month. Make sure they work properly, the batteries are replaced. So they are working because those are going to be your first lines of uh, detection. Your next one is going to be uh, practicing. Like I said, just make sure everyone in the house knows what to do, where to go in case of emergency. Just keep practicing it once a month or once a week, whenever you have free time with your family to do so. And the last thing would be get outside and uh, where your family is at, like I said, call 911 so we can get over there and mitigate that problem. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next question is, do you have a home fire escape plan? Yes, no, or not sure. <clears throat> Does everyone have two ways out of their home, out of every room? No. <laughs> Uh, if anyone out on Facebook or here would like assistance in developing a home fire safe plan, just give us a call at the fire department or send us a message on Facebook. We'll be glad to sit down with you and help you and your family be a little bit safer. So moving on, um, are there any questions about kitchen safety, smoke detectors, or escape plans? See if any pop up or if anybody in the audience has ones, you can just shout it out. No, there are no one. Oh, yes, but do I have to worry about electric stoves, Lieutenant James? So you do have to worry about electric stoves, and not as so much as the carbon monoxide. But even with an electric stove, you're still going to have the potential of catching something on fire. No, you do not have an open flame, but there is still a potential they do get hot enough that they will catch things on fire. So as far as with an electric stove, you do need to worry about them, and also keep your safety as well. Also. Sir, what about pressure cookers, air fryers, etc.? Uh, Chief Soto, um, absolutely. Anytime you're dealing with uh, pressure cooks, especially just it's kind of in the name as, as far as it says pressure cooker. Um, the valves and everything you want to make sure it, it's all the way released before you try to pull the top off of it. Um, the other thing is, anytime you're dealing with any kind of electricity that's going to produce heat, um, you need to be mindful to make sure your cords. Um, everything stays clear of it because, like I said, it's still producing heat. So anything close to it has a tendency from that radiant heat to catch it on fire. So you want to keep a pretty good area clear around it. Christine, will you mark the ones that we've answered as answered, please? So how do you teach young children the importance of not panicking in an emergency? Uh, this is something that 
we all have to deal with as first responders. All the volunteers in the audience and those watching at home know that the more we panic, the more everyone around us panics. The best way is practice. You talked about practicing your home fire escape plan and not just say, oh, there's a fire, let's practice. Let's actually set off the alarm so that they know what that sound signifies. And Chief Frank, will you answer that one? Where can I replace my smoke detectors? So smoke detectors can be purchased at most hardware stores. Uh, Walmart carries them. There's some programs that do give out smoke detectors. And as far as it's usually something that's simple enough that has instructions that give you directions on how to where to place it and how to replace it. Definitely. Got participants type, we'll hold off. We wanna answer all these questions if we can. So for the employees up here, where's the best location to put a smoke detector? Kitchen. Where should you install them? Right above your stove in your kitchen. In your kitchen, maybe. Yeah. The hallway outside your bedrooms. Living area. In your home. <laughs> Are the weird detectors universal or should I be careful to pick the right brand? Wired. Wired, but it's wired. Oh, it's my apologies. Um, honestly, the wired ones are really good, but they're typically wired together. So it alerts everybody in the home. They're not necessarily powered for that. Uh, if they're wired well, it's great for everybody in the home to know that all the smoke detectors are going off. So you just get out. Um, and I would be careful to pick a good high quality one. Uh, there are several reputable brands um, and your safety is not something that I think we should be cutting corners on. So I would invest whatever you feel is appropriate. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So I failed to introduce myself. I'm TJ Cathy, the fire chief at Portalis. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about ISO score here. Our ISO score is a community score. It affects departments, state fire funding, as well as residential and business insurance premiums. So let's move on to the next slide and we'll break it down. So for an ISO rating, there's 105.5 total possible points, 50 of which are related specifically to the fire department for hose, pump, and ladder tests, staffing, training, and equipment. Then there's 40 points available for the water system, for water storage, water pressures, hydrants, hydrant testing, and so on. And then there's 10 points for emergency communications for dispatch and so on. And then by nights tonight, tonight, they help with community risk reduction because we're helping provide education, provide smoke detectors to the community. Um, this is fire prevention week and fire prevention month. So this is our big push when we do, how many tours have y'all done today? Two? We've done two today, yes. Totally. How many kids? 70, about, about 70. About 70 40 total. 30, so. And that's just one day. I mean, we have typically have tours all week. We had one yesterday of 60 students. Yeah. Okay, so any questions moving on to the next slide about ISO score? Surely I didn't communicate it that clearly. <laughs> no, got some likes. Okay, I'm typing. Oh, we got a typing. Um, we do have a slide about fire hydrants here in a minute that we'll cover. So different insurances use ISO. So the question of how does this affect premiums? Different insurances use the ISO score differently. A lot of times, if you're anywhere from a one to a three, you get a set lower premium. If your area is a four to whatever, it's a higher premium. If it's a all the way up to a nine, you may pay more for insurance than if you're in an ISO district of a one or a two, if that makes sense. And then if you are a 10 in your area, that typically means your home is uninsurable. Um, it's like golf, your lower score is better on your ISO score, even though they give it a point system. 
So uh, ISO one is the best to where a 10 is the worst or is higher better. So the why ISO is important, I think we kind of covered it, but it definitely affects all the area fire departments and not just our departments, but all departments across our nation are funding from our states and also the insurance premiums for homes and businesses. So there's a proration score. The question is, how is funding tied to ISO? So ISO comes in and they rate a department, whether it's a volunteer department or a paid department, and they give you all your points and that gives you your score. And then insurance companies call ISO and use that for the insurance premium, then funding for the New Mexico State Fire Marshal's Office. <laughs> there's different funding scales for different ISO scores. So if you're an ISO one, which is the best, you get more funding than if you're a lower score of an eight or a nine. Now there is a grant process that is the fire protection grant that everybody should have just got an email with their awards. Oh wait, there's only one from here that got it in Roosevelt County and he didn't show up. I'll pick on him here a little bit. Um, but the fire protection grant is specifically aimed at improving ISO scores. So a portion of the money that the state gets for from insurance premiums goes to fire funding. And then a portion of that goes to the fire protection grant, which is specifically intended to improve ISO scores. No one that we got one typing. Good. Yes. So the question is, does the turnout of folks to community outreach program like this have any effect on ISO score? Yes. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the community risk reduction points that are available, they only rate you on a scale from one to a hundred. That's a hundreds of max possible points that you can get. Uh, that 5.5 for community risk reduction is like extra credit. It doesn't hurt you, but it sure could bump you into that next higher score. Okay, if there's no more questions, we'll move on to the hydrant one. Okay, so. The city of Portales has approximately 310 hydrants. Uh, we hired a third party company, Waterway, that came in and they've completed the testing of our hydrants. The, we're still waiting on the report from Waterway, but they painted the bonnets, the tops of the hydrants, different colors to signify how many gallons per minute their calculations say that that hydrant will flow. So a blue hydrant is supposed to flow 1,500 gallons per minute. Green is 1,000 to 1499, orange 500 to 999, red 499 or less, and then a black hydrant signifies it's out of service. Now, with a third party coming in and us not having that report, we don't know why that hydrant may be out of service yet. Once that gets released, our water department will go back and try to get all the ones that are in our area that are not corrected yet. I will say this, this is the first time in my 18 years that we've ever had blue hydrants and we've had a lot more green. And honestly, according in speaking with retired chief knuckles, we have less black hydrants than we've had in the previous years. Any questions about fire hydrant testing? Is there a timeline on the release of that report? They said it typically takes about two weeks. Um, so hopefully next week. If there's no questions about hydrants, we'll go on to some grant awards. Um, in FY23, we received a fire protection grant for a little over 162,000, which completed our SCBA project. Uh, that puts all brand new Scott X1 pros or I'm not X3 sure pros. X3 pros on all of our response apparatus and all new bottles, um, which will allow us to hopefully distribute our current throughout our county and potentially the state to departments that may not have what they need. Um, we received funding just this week for the FY24 Trauma System Development Grant for our fourth powered stretcher. Um, we did have three, uh, three grant applications in. Unfortunately, we were not funded, excuse me, for the FY24 Fire Protection Grant uh, for a little over 114,000 for extra extrication equipment. 
Um, we do have two grants that are in through the New Mexico Department of Health uh, for the FY25 Local Systems Improvement Project for a little over 184,000 for four new cardiac monitors and the FY25 Vehicle Purchase Project for a little over 251,000 for a new type one ambulance. Let's move on to the next slide. Let's talk about some run volume for the city of Portales. Um, this is just evaluating January through August of this year. We've had 2,240 total calls. 86% were EMS and 14% were fire. 82% of our total calls were inside the incorporated city limits and 18% were outside. Uh, within that, the disturbing number is the 475, excuse me, instances where calls for service overran our current response capability, causing delays in response and care to our community. On average, that's 60 times a month and twice a day. Moving on to the next question, have you ever utilized services from PFD? Yes, no, or maybe. Good portion. Good. Still moving. Again. You hit the wrong one. I did. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next slide. I have fingers. Okay, this shows our just our EMS calls only. We run fire and ambulance calls in our district. And this separates our EMS calls by, by zone. Our city's divided east and west by Main Street and north and south by the railroad tracks. So during this time period, 5.5% of our calls were in the northeast zone, 14% in the northwest, 15 in the southeast, 46% in the southwest, 15.5% of our EMS calls were outside the city limits, so it would be classified as the county, and then 4% of our run volume originated out of RGH, the hospital that's transferred to the airport or another facility. So again, our city is divided north and south by the railroad tracks and east and west by Maine. That gives us the four zones. Anything outside the city limits would be classified as the county. And the reason I reiterate that is the next question is, what zone, which zone do you live in? Like we're hoping right around 30% in the county, oh, 27% in the Northwest, 18%, I think that's what that says, in the Southwest, and 27 27% in the Southeast. So it's pretty even in the county, Northwest, and Southeast. Interesting. Moving on to the next slide, we're going to talk about response time. And this is from the time that we're dispatched to the time that we're on scene. For this time period, our EMS average response time was 7.4 minutes with an average response time for fire of 8.5 minutes. Uh, when you look at response time by zone uh, in minutes, for the Southwest zone, it averaged 2.9 minutes, Southeast zone, 7.9 minutes, Northwest zone, 9.8 minutes, Northeast zone, 15.4 minutes, county responses average 14.4 minutes, and responses to RGH, which are 99 times out of 100 not emergent, uh, was 21.9 minutes. So any questions about response times? Must be a long question. And everybody in the audience is looking around like, who's typing? Who's typing? <laughs> Maybe somebody online. Okay. Why is the Northeast response time higher? That's a great question. And one that me and my officers have looked at after getting this data. Um, when you look at our response times, our first call in a succession 
our response time is about three minutes, which is good. That's what we expect as first responders, especially inside the city limits. Second call is about four minutes. But after that second call is when we run out of people and don't have anyone to respond. So we're waiting on either the first ambulance to clear the first call or respond from the hospital to respond to that Northeast zone or waiting for overtime to come in and help respond. I mean, Emma's our part-time clerk and how many times have you had to go on calls with us? A few. Okay. Why do you think the largest percentage of calls come from the Southwest the question is the nursing homes, ENMU. I think it's a combination. One, it's our biggest zone. It covers the most area. It also has Coronado, Good Life, and a few other areas that have more of our elderly population that need our assistance more often, which is also answers the 46% in the Southwest zone. Uh, what is preventing the use of the substation in the North? Great question. Um, I was asked in a uh, tour of that station, uh, when do we want to staff it? My answer was tomorrow. Uh, the problem we're facing is over half of our operational staff is one year or less experience. Uh, we have 12 people in EMS classes right now, five in paramedic, three in intermediate, and four in ENT basic, and one open position. It would not be safe for my personnel or the community to put less experienced, untrained people at a station with no one to train them. Can they find the address? Can they pump a truck? Do they have the EMS certification necessary to provide the care that our community needs? We have to look at it as a fire department, not just tomorrow, but next week, next year, five years from now, on what's going to serve the community the best and can't make a rash decision that would negatively impact the future of our community safety. And if I don't fully answer a question, feel free to pipe in or ask again. <laughs> Love the questions. All right, no one typing, let's move on to the next one. Okay, what response time do you expect from Portales Fire Department? And I'll make this statement. I'm a third generation volunteer, second generation EMT. And I look at things of how would I want it done for my family, for someone that I care about. So my personal answer to this would be zero to three minutes. Now, it's different for us in Portales than it would be for a volunteer department. And we'll talk about volunteers here in a little bit uh, because they have a special place in my heart for the service that they provide. So the majority of people say a four to six minute. Um, there's actually standards in place from the NFPA, uh, it's NFPA 1710, that set hard standards on response times for fire and EMS. And it includes putting on our bunker gear for a fire call and everything, but right now we do not meet that standard due to our staffing. Okay, move on to the next one. This ought to be fun. Name three of the most common fire or EMS calls by type. Grass fires, seizures, lift assist, house, MVA, card, cardiac, 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 car crash, <laughs> mental health, grass fire, kitchen. Ah, somebody's painted kitchen earlier. Suicidal, heart attack. But moving that fast, it's hard to keep up. Overdoses. And as I said before, on this type of slide, the more votes it gets, the bigger it gets. So right now it looks like lift assist, mental health, house are all getting the most votes. Crash, yeah. Balls. Dog bites. Dog bites. It's in there.
I don't want to cut anybody off. We'll let them go. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so our actual top six calls by type for this time frame for EMS, it was motor vehicle accidents or collisions, falls, breathing problem, psychiatric problem, cardiac, and seizure. On the fire side, smoke investigation, grass fire, fire alarm, motor vehicle accident or collision, structure fire, and utility problems such as natural gas, propane, electricity. So any questions about the top six calls by type? Next slide. And again, y'all the audience can just raise your hand if you have a question. It's okay. Hmm? No. Oh, we got somebody typing. What was your favorite call you've been asked to? <laughs> Anyone? No? Shortly after I got my paramedic license, we were dispatched to a gentleman that was having trouble. Um, he couldn't hardly talk. Uh, we arrived on scene. Uh, his heart rate was about 30. Um, due to the great work of the team that I was helping, um, we were able to get that gentleman to the hospital and provide excellent patient care as been as, has been expected of all first responders since the thought of first responders. Um, two weeks later, that after having a massive heart attack getting flown out to Lubbock, he was able to come back to our station and say thank you. Anybody else have a favorite call? No? All right, uh, do you bill for every call? Okay, so again, we provide fire protection and EMS services. We are a PRC certified ambulance service, so we are required by their rules to bill by their tariff. So their tariff says certain requirements for billing. Anytime we transport somebody, we are required by the PRC to bill. Um, if we arrive on scene and provide treatment, or do an assessment, we have to bill. Um, if someone fell down and just needs assistance up in their chair, there is no bill. Uh, fire calls, there's no bill unless it is a scheduled arranged standby that we arrange with the person. When we have the staff to do so, we can bill for that standby. We also receive reimbursements, which we'll talk about here in a minute from wildland grass fires from the state forestry. Oh, there's a great question. Can all EMTs do the same thing? Does someone like take it? No, no you're good. You're right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's several different levels of EMT. Uh, the uh, first responder that has a pretty small scope of practice and a shorter training time. They can do a certain amount of things to help people. Then there's EMT basic. They can do a little bit more, can transport patients, uh, but they have a limited scope of practice on the medications they can give and the treatments they can provide. Then you move up to AEMT or intermediate, which is about a 400 hour course or a college semester, sometimes two, right, Emma? <laughs> um, they, where you learn how to do IVs, draw blood, give medications via IV, uh, and a little bit more advanced airway stuff. And then you move on to paramedic, where standby. Never fails. Oh. 
All right. So where were we at? All EMTs doing the same thing. Um, as paramedics, we have a more expanded scope of practice to where we can do more airway stuff, give more medications, um, manually defibrillate. Uh, paramedics are the only ones that can give certain medications, like for seizures and certain airway medications, cardiac medications and such. Um, so paramedic is the highest level. Now I do would like to brag in our department, we have received Two uh, a special skill for the use of ketamine for um, excited delirium and for pain, which is a great medication um, that we had to apply for the state so that we can use that medication in conjunction or in lieu of other pain medicine. Does that answer that question? Yes and no. When you say you're using ketamine in lieu of other medications, is there a certain medication that you were looking to avoid? Not avoid, just have another option that would be better for certain patients. Um, we carry some narcotics that may affect elderly differently than a young man like yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> How many at our fire department would love to respond to a baby who is, I wonder who wrote that, uh, has been surrendered at Safe Haven Baby Box? I think every single one of us would love to have that opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what about vital checks at stations? Yeah, we do blood pressure checks, especially Emma. Um, free of charge at the fire station uh, if you're on blood pressure medicine and just need your blood pressure monitored or if you need to check and see if your machine is reading accurately we'll be glad to compare to try to give you a better idea of where you're at and EMTs take care of all the top six calls um, do we mean EMT basics EMT immediates or EMT paramedics can we go back to that slide Okay, officers, um, <clears throat> of the EMS calls, which ones do you feel a paramedic needs to be on? Seizure would require a paramedic if available. For sure. Your cardiac patients are gonna require a paramedic as well. Breathing problems, if they're severe, they're gonna need a paramedic. MBAs, if you have major intrusion in the compartments, they're gonna need a paramedic. What about psychiatric? Yeah, your excited delirium and things like that. Um, you're going to need a paramedic to, to help sedate. The only other option is to, you know, use physical restraints, which puts uh, first responders at risk, and and, and the patient and the patient. And all EMTs can take care of those patients to their own level within their scope of, of practice. Yes. yes. And even a fall, um, for a long time, EMT intermediates couldn't give narcotics pain medicine without doctor's orders. So it potentially delayed that patient having pain relief, whether they'd have to either call the ER and get the doctor's permission or wait for the paramedic to arrive on scene. Uh, thankfully, that changed our state scope of practice to where an intermediate can give that pain medicine. But there are other medications that may be needed that an intermediate can't give if they're having severe muscle spasms but due to a fractured hip or something like that. Uh, the benzodiazepines, uh, Versed and Valium um, are only in the paramedic scope of practice, which are also the same medications that we give for seizures. When should the public help a situation and when should they wait for the fire department or ENTs? A lot of that's gonna be situation dependent. Um, the main thing is not creating more problem. Um, if you're there to help and you have training, that's completely different than someone that's not able to calm themselves for that situation. I do a lot of first aid talks 
um, when I'm off shift. And one of the biggest things we talk about the golden rules of first aid is to stay calm because if you're calm, your patient's going to be calm. Um, some people don't have that ability to remain calm and that's not disrespectful. I don't mean that disrespectful to them. They haven't trained the way that first responders have. They haven't been exposed to it and built up that defense mechanism to be like a duck and calm and cool on the top and paddling like crazy under the water, right? So I would say when in, when in doubt, help. And when help arrives, offer to help. If first responders don't need it, they will thank you and they will go about their day and do what we've been trained to do. Do we do basic life-saving training with law enforcement? Um, for the city of Portales and some of the other agencies, we do provide CPR. Um, mm -hmm. We also provide CPR class, not as Portales Fire Department, but we do have instructors that do it on their days off for the community if they would like to take a CPR class as well. Y'all don't want to answer some of these questions? You're doing great, sir. Who do you do first aid talks with? Me specifically or us as a department? I think they're talking specifically when you're talking off too. Oh, okay. So uh, I help with several different ministries. Uh, one is a men's ministry out of Mason, Texas, um, that I do a four sessions first aid and CPR class for. Uh, for me personally, uh, we as a department do first aid talks. We've done them at the junior high. Colton went and did one this month at the junior high. Uh, we've done it for Boy Scouts and several different entities upon request when we have available personnel. Love the question. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so this one's tricky. How is Portales Fire Department funded? So how do you think? EMS billing? Or does that say EMA billing? <laughs> Fire funds, city funds. And... My boss is in the back, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Magic. Magic, yes. Magic. <laughs> Sprinkle a little crazy. Did I miss any? A couple of grants, fire fund. Um, I will mention this. We've been very successful on grants uh, over the last four years. We received just under $1 million in grant funding over the last four years. Lots of overtime. Um, to that last year, so in 2022, our personnel averaged 750 hours of overtime past their already 2,756 regularly scheduled hours. What's that bottom right one say? Bot on the center, B O T on the center. Bot on the center. I'm not sure. not sure what that means. All right, so let's move on. Let's talk about how we were funded last fiscal year. So, of our total operating budget, it consists of city funded budget, which was 87 percent, EMS fund, which was 0.5 percent, and fire fund that was 12.5 percent. Within our city funded budget, 30 percent of that was supported by our EMS billing revenue. Uh, we do receive a county reimbursements for services that was 1% and our wildland reimbursements, like I mentioned earlier, for grass fires, that was 0.2%. So any questions about how we're funded? Anticipation. Mm -hmm. Do you believe we need more funding? 
I believe that, and I can only speak for fire departments and us in the city of Portales. Uh, I believe that every department in the city could justify needing more funding. Um, I definitely think the volunteers need more funding and I definitely think the state needs to make some adjustments to our EMS funding. As I mentioned earlier, it only accounts for 0.5% of our EM, our total operating budget. Okay, why does 30% of billing go back to the station? Um, we are a municipal fire department that is funded by the city. Um, let's see what they say. Okay. Um, we are funded by the city. Uh, we are the city of Talos Fire Department. We are service, not a business. We'll never make more than we cost. So that goes to offset what we cost the city. Why are the grassland fires such a small reimbursement? Um, that is their formula funding that we don't have any say on. Um, all the departments in this area, and I'll talk about it on the next slide, do a great job of interagency cooperation. Um, but the state decides their reimbursement rates for different types of trucks and different types of training. And we can start it in and accept what they send us. You okay back there? <laughs> What is the approximate funding number 1%? The county reimbursement, I'm guessing? That's the one that says 1%. I think they're asking how much money that is. Oh, how much money? That's $30,300. What? <laughs> They changed the oh, never mind. You scared them. You scared them. Yeah, yeah, anyway. All right, next slide. Okay, um, so our community is extremely blessed. Uh, we have very high quality fire and EMS departments providing services throughout our entire county. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the interagency cooperation is amazing and only taught by the great people providing these services. Our community is served by five municipal departments and two county departments. Um, at this time, I would like to recognize those departments. Uh, of course, we have Portales, that's a municipal department, and we have Causey, Dora, Elida, Floyd, and then our county departments is Arch and Mill and Sand. Um, I would like to do a special shout out to the chiefs. We have Chief Jay Lang at Arch, uh, Chief Russell Bilbrey at Mill and Sand, Chief Daryl Chenault at Elida, Chief Darwin Chenault at Floyd, who's one of our retired division chiefs, Chief Paul Luscombe at Dora, and Chief Michael Mapp at Kazi. Um, and again, we, I think our community and as a whole fails to realize the benefit of the amazing volunteers and paid services that we have in our community. I'm on the Fire Chief's Board of Directors and not all counties have a system for fire and EMS that is this strong and provides this high quality service. And so just as I said earlier, volunteers have a special place in my heart. And right now our country served by approximately 75% is volunteer service. And volunteers are in the name, they don't get paid. They might get paid by call, they might get a meal, but they, that's not what they do for a living. So when they get called, they have to leave their job that they're getting paid to do, take time off of work to go and help their community. And that's a special thing that I, for one, greatly appreciate. Um, and I think that our community is extremely blessed, not just in the quality, but also the interagency cooperation. When something happens, we all go help. And that's the way it should be. And I think our community as a whole could take a page out of the fire and EMS book and work that well together. So any questions about volunteer services in our area? Y'all wanna get the guys when they walk in, clap for them. You should, you should clap for them. Everybody? Good job, guys. Good job. 
Can anyone volunteer? Um, yes and no. I mean, there are certain requirements to volunteer. Um, each department has their own set of bylaws and you would have to visit with each individual department to see, uh, but I'd be willing to say that pretty much every department would be looking for a, a good hand. And just for all anybody that's potentially watching on Facebook, if you are interested in volunteering, um, you can reach out to me and I will get you in contact with the nearest department to where you are um, to make that introduction. And which department is volunteer? Ah, that's, that's messed up. There it is. Anyway, I'll get you in touch with the department because um, that way you can get in contact with them. Because as I mentioned earlier, the volunteers aren't at the station waiting for a phone call or waiting for the tone to drop. They have to be on guard, ready to respond 24 seven. So which volunteer department is my favorite? I, I'm so like all? No. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I know exactly who said this. And the fact that my grandpa, my dad, my uncle and myself have all volunteered at Dora, I, I feel like I have to say Dora. Um, how are the volunteer department funded? Would a volunteer chief like to answer that? You want me to go for it? Yep. So the volunteer services are funded in exactly the same way that the Catalyst Fire Department is funded. We're graded on an ISO score in district and out of district. So that ISO score is relative to our our response times and our our ability to, to function within our municipal boundaries, but not only within our municipal boundaries. We're also rating our ISO boundaries as well. And that's an out of district ISO rating where we have to maintain certain shuttle flows. Of, our tankers have to be able to maintain a certain gallon per minute shuttle flow on a house fire and so forth and so on. So all of our funding is exactly where the, this is the kind of the discrepancy that, that Chief Kathy and I talk about a lot between volunteers and paid service. We're com we, we work to do the same thing, but we're, we're uh, and we're, we're judged in the same way, but we don't have the same ability to, to earn those. So there's always a big discrepancy between ISO. ISO only ranks one group. They don't rank volunteer or a, or a, or a pay. You just get ranked by the ISO. Rate. And that's how the state, uh, state bar marshal talks. So. What? Yeah. Okay. Um, so for those on Facebook, I'll just reiterate what Chief Lufscombe said, that they receive the same state funding that we do through the same formula. And ISO doesn't evaluate a volunteer department differently than a paid department. It's the same rating score, which, in my opinion, kind of handicaps volunteer departments because they don't have the same support and the same structure. Um, but that's just my opinion. Um, Hopefully that answers the Facebook question. Are there any needs that are unique to smaller volunteer departments? I'd say yes. I would say the number of people wanting to volunteer in a smaller department because there's fewer number of people in that area definitely is a a, a great need. And that's a yeah, a little bit more unique. Chief Bilbrey, how big is your district? It's it, it, if I'm not mistaken, it's the largest district in just under Elias, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the second largest, Light is largest. Because I know our response district is 308 square miles and we're right there in the middle. Yeah, from somewhere there. And y'all go into Lee County as well yeah, quite a we, bit because it's it all runs together. And fewer fewer people living in Elm Sand is you just provide so our numbers are going through that again. Yes, sir. So do volunteer fire departments receive funding from county? I'm guessing that means Roosevelt County. Also, what at what percent? What at percent or dollars? Anybody? So based on my understanding, um, 
in previous years, the county has paid volunteer departments a set amount for the entire year. Um, from what I understand, last year was $7,000 for each department. Now, I'm not sure if the county departments that the fiscal agent is Roosevelt County, if they receive funding or not. Um, I'm not sure what this year's agreement will hold. Um, that would be up to each individual municipal department and their chiefs to determine that agreement. And there are no unanswered questions. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. All right, so which is the greater priority? Potholes, bumpy roads, dumpsters, or public safety? Many of you have heard me tell this story, but if there's a pothole on the street right by the fire station, anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 people drive over today. It generates a lot of phone calls, a lot of community support to try to get that fixed. The 2,000 to 5,000 people is a lot. Um, if our public safety entities, our dispatch, PDSO, volunteers, all of us are extremely busy for a 24 hour period, it might impact 200 to 250 people. But which one's more important? A pothole, a bumpy road, a dumpster, all need to get addressed, but those are inconveniences. If public safety entities don't have the resources to meet the need of the community, that risks not only the community's safety, but also the safety of the first responders. <clears throat> Move on to the next slide. So are there any questions that I didn't cover or anything else that you would like to have answered? Thank you for all you do to keep our community safe. You're very welcome. So let me just throw a question out there while people are thinking. We have a lot of volunteers here and we have quite a few of our personnel here. Why do you do it? Help out your community. Help out your community. How does the lack of personnel impact your current personnel? That's a great question. Um, would a volunteer like to answer that? How it affects you guys, Kelly? Um, our department is extremely down in numbers. And so anytime uh, like we need repairs on trucks, you know, it's amazing how people just vanish, you know, and, and it's the, the same people doing doing everything, trying to just keep it afloat. And and you hate for it to fold on your watch. But it, but it's you know, with the volunteer round, it's it's definitely a possibility. And I know you guys are constantly looking for help. So it's it's just and and I think kids these days, I teach second grade and and you ask kids what do you want to be when you grow up they grow up, they want to be YouTubers. They don't want to be firemen. You know, a few years ago that's what they wanted to be firemen and policemen. Now they think they can you know make a living and, and spend their life as a YouTuber. So even even the younger generations aren't, you know, have that part for volunteer. <clears throat> I definitely agree with that. Um, for us as a paid department, um, the lack of personnel contributes to symptoms of PTSD. The same personnel running on the same terrible calls or the same type of calls over and over and over again. And not having a true worth life balance. As I mentioned earlier, our guys worked in the neighborhood of 3,500 hours last year. 
when the average work week is 2080. Okay, it contributes to a lot of burnout. And for us as first responders, it doesn't sit well when the community's needs aren't met. And that doesn't help our mental health either when you're on back to back to back to back calls and you know somebody is sitting there waiting. Our fire departments allowing their personnel to use medical cannabis for treatments, physical and or mental. Are there any studies or data on this? Um, I've done not a ton, but quite a bit of research on this. Um, for those departments that are PRC certified, uh, we still fall under the DOT regulations, which follow the federal guidelines, so it is prohibited. Uh, there have been a lot of studies that show that certain types of cannabis are very beneficial for people with PTSD, especially those with sleep disturbances. So at this time, no, we personally do not allow it for that reason. And until the testing catches up to where I can know how much this individual is affected right now. I don't, I don't care that it's in their system. I wanna know how much, how impaired they are right now, because if we can't operate in a safe manner, that makes everyone else less safe. Because the responsibility of being a first responder comes first and foremost, and we don't wanna put our community at any great risk. How does it affect your personnel's families, wives and kids? Um, so for anyone that watched the council meeting, I um, not only said happy anniversary to my wife, I praised our fire department families because I think they are one of the <laughs> behind the scenes values that most people don't realize because volunteers paid alike. There's missed anniversaries, missed birthdays, missed school plays, all to provide a service to the community. I mean, as a volunteer, I remember leaving church in the middle of communion to go fight a grass fire. When the tone goes off, you go help. So I definitely think our families are not as appreciated as they should be. I know we as a department work on appreciating our families, um, but I think we could always do better. Chief, I think you got something down there. Uh, one of the other things I just wanted to mention is that if you guys look at any kind of statistics on fire, law enforcement, anything like that, we, our family um, environment and mental health is much more disturbed than the general public. Uh, divorce rates are high, suicide rates are high, uh, mental illness is high for everybody that's in this field. And it affects everybody differently, but it is something that is a problem that has been identified and is in an attempt to address, but not all efforts are as, uh, make as big of an improvement on it as we'd like for them to. That's a very valid point. And also the cancer risk for firefighters is 60 to 70, 60 to 70 percent higher than the average public. And that's something that we've taken steps to try to improve. The city has helped us and they did purchase us a bunker gear extractor and dryer so that we can keep our gear cleaner and try to eliminate some of those carcinogens, um, which wasn't a cheap piece of equipment. Uh, adding to that, um, when he talks about the high risk in cancer, that's every firefighter. That's not paid volunteers. Yes. That that goes with everybody. I know sometimes volunteers tend to get left out. You're fighting the same fires. You're exposed to the same carcinogens, the same gases, everything that we're exposed to, you're exposed to as well. It, it doesn't say, oh, that guy's a volunteer. Uh, let's skip him, I guess. It doesn't work like that. Volunteers are just as susceptible as we are. Yes. Definitely got somebody typing. So oh, how can the public help our fire department? Uh, when I go back to the pothole story, advocate for us. 
city councils, county commissions, state representatives, state legislature, they all follow what their constituents tell them is important. And I realize that fire and EMS is often an afterthought, even though I think that everybody in our community would agree that public safety is the number one priority. I'd venture to say that our city council gets a million more phone calls in support of a pothole than they do fire and EMS or law enforcement for that matter. <clears throat> and the other thing that you can do to help is come to events like this where we're trying to yes. teach you how to be safer in your home. Um, make sure that you talk with your primary care providers, you know, make sure that you're taking your medication the way that you're supposed to and just reduce your risk for having an emergency that helps us by, and I, and I don't wanna sound lazy by saying that it reduces our workload, but what it does do is it improves the health of the community and it makes our job easier because we're working with people who are healthier and more conscientious about what they're doing. Thank you. Second Lieutenant Schultz. What kind of donations are fire departments allowed to receive from the public? Um, so I think any donations are allowed. Um, certain money values have to be approved by council and that's not a deterrent. That's just a bookkeeping thing. I would pose a question to everyone here. Although I feel we have a amazing fire and EMS system in our community due to all the amazing people that participate, what's one thing that you would recommend that would make things better? Or that would help? Public knowledge, information. Yes, sir. Everybody's leaving this meeting with more knowledge than they came in with. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Much Thank appreciated you. to all of y'all as a Joe generic citizen here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, and again, I do feel that the community overwhelmingly supports us. Um, there's no doubt in my mind. Um, as a whole, the community does. But the changes that I feel need to be made to help our department need to come from the community to the fiscal agents, whether that be city council or county commission or state legislature so that we can have the resources we need to adequately meet the needs of the community. What is the average cost to equip a firefighter for service? A lot. lot. <laughs> well, we just got 10 air packs. Yes. And that cost us 16, 16, 16 air packs. And that cost us $160,000. 164 and change. Um, bunker gear, you're looking at about $7,000 a set. Um, and that's just jacket and pants. Then you got to do boots, Nomex, helmet, gloves, gloves, um, regular uniform, and then training. Uh, EMS training is expensive and time consuming. Um, as I mentioned, an intermediate class is approximately 400 hours. Paramedic is over 1600 hours. And in my opinion, and I think the gentleman up here with me would agree that that's a necessity to provide a high quality service to our community. Uh, but it generally takes us about two years to get somebody trained from no certifications, no experience to firefighter one and two and intermediate or AEMT. And then maintaining response while everyone is in class. Yeah. So as Chief Lovescombe said, our equipment is more and more expensive, uh, three quarters of a million dollar for an engine. Ambulances are in the neighborhood of anywhere from 250 to 300,000. Am I doing something wrong? Okay. Um, I'll try to reiterate what he said. And not to mention the delays in getting equipment. How long have y'all been waiting for your new rescue truck, Chief Luscom? How long have you been waiting for your rescue truck? Um, 
27 months this time when we got the notification today that we finally got a new number from Ford, but it's in storage now we're going to keep going because they don't have to put on the truck. So we've been waiting 27 months with funding allocated for it. And we're some of the lucky ones. Some of them have been waiting as much as 48 months. Ago. Yeah. Up to four years is the wait on some apparatus. <clears throat> How often does equipment need to replace on average? Um, typical service life um, is usually due to mileage on an ambulance, uh, but 10 years uh, is the average for an ambulance. Uh, engine is usually 10 to 15 years, um, but I'd venture to say that the departments in our county are running engines that are much older. We currently have a 1978 Hendrickson that was Portalis's first custom truck in service. For an FPA bunker gear is 10 year lifespan. Yep. And you have to replace it. Which shift is your favorite? <laughs> what is it, Chief? What is it, Chief? So <laughs> at the fire department, the shift before you is lazy, the shift after you is nitpicky, and your shift's the best. So as the chief, they're all my shift. But I did promote from B shift, so they're the chosen shift. <laughs> Dude, they're the best. Now I do have a healthy appreciation for C shift <laughs> and A shift too. How often do you show up to a fire with an appropriate amount of personnel? Never. Uh, the NFPA standard recommends 16 people at a residential structure fire. Right now we have eight people on shift. Then you have somebody off on vacation and somebody or two somebody's off a class um there it's been known to happen where we have to make initial attack with less than five people on a residential structure fire in instances of a commercial fire we should have in the neighborhood of anywhere from 36 to 45 people that requires us to rely on mutual aid from our great partners in the county volunteer departments and neighboring communities, and neighboring communities. With no unanswered questions, um, I would like to say to everyone here and everybody out on Facebook, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, my email is all over our Facebook page. You can Facebook message us. You can call the fire station. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Um, as the gentleman mentioned, the more information we can get out, the better off everybody is. The community is safer, and hopefully we can generate community support to get the resources we need. I'd like to say a special thanks to Christine for helping us with the IT part of our presentation. Our city manager, Sarah Austin, for being here with us tonight. Um, all of our personnel that came in to help and all the volunteers. And then I also like to thank Ace Hardware. Uh, they helped us get the smoke detectors and the fire extinguishers. Sonic gave us gift cards, uh, Oliver's Emporium, Sweetwaters at Landles do drop in, and the Courthouse Cafe all helped. So with that, we'll go on to the next slide and I thank you for your continued support. <laughs>